Hey everyone, I've got a lot of exciting things to run through today. Uh, first, we're going to be talking about some optimized lightning workflows. We also have a photorealistic workflow that I think you guys will love. And we're going to answer the big question, is Photoshop dead yet? Let's get into it. Okay. First, we're going to start with a photo-oriented workflow. This is related to a new model that came out recently, RealViz. It's the fourth version. It's actually the top uh, photorealistic model in the STXL top 10 uh, leaderboards. If you go down to the photo real uh, testing tab, you'll see that's the top contender right now. And I found a very cool way to, to get a really, really strong photorealistic feel for these uh, photos, not only portrait, but also action shots, really just all around uh, great, great results. Um, I want to also give a good shout out to uh, Lone Star, who had a really, really good uh, foundation to set this up, uh, made a few tweaks to it as well. So um, if we look on the left hand side, the loading is what it normally is. Obviously, I'm bringing in this real Viz Pro model. And the the magic kind of starts to happen uh, in the sampler itself. So because it's kind of lightning-ish, um, we are going to be only going forward with four steps, and the CFG is going to be kept really, really low. Uh, I kept it at 1.35. I was playing a little bit about 125, 115. Uh, anything above this, especially at four steps, it gets really challenging, and the effect doesn't look that great. So, um, And then take note also of the sampler and the scheduler, as opposed to SGM, uh, which I was using for the Regular lightning models, um, Karas seems to go really well, especially with the DPM++ 2M. So if you have those settings, I think you should be in good spot. Uh, you can see the initial render, though, uh, FYI, this is not the final product. You'll see what it uh, looks like at the end. And I also have the high res fix. And you'll see um, this is really valuable. Uh, it actually plugs into the um, uh, sampler directly. So it doesn't need a special preview window. It actually uses that same window. And um, I'm upscaling it by uh, only about 25%. I found if I don't upscale at all and keep it at one, uh, the effects are not really great. You see a lot of stretching and weirdness going on. Uh, anything above it, it also seemed to not have that creative result because we're only going to high res at four steps. So we're only going to do a very, very slight adjustment in this upscale and also keeping the denoise at only about 50%, 0.53. Uh, you can play with this a little bit. I think depending on the effect you're trying to get, also the type of shot you're trying to use, it'll get you a different sort of uh, level of grain, level of detail that you would like for your images. So for this portrait, at least, I found the best uh, to be roughly around 50% uh, to be successful. I also tried multiple iterations, multiple iterations with different levels of steps. I could not get a really good result out of it, so I definitely recommend keeping it to a single iteration for the high-res fix. Um, though what this does lead into is the ultimate STF scale. Now that I have at 10 steps, the model you can see is a beam from the use everywhere node, right? So it's just using that same lightning model, um, positive and negative prompts, also the same. It's just beaming in as well as the VAE. So you can see it is only 10 steps and, uh, the CFG is five. I'm using the normal sort of standard rendering of the 3M STE, the exponential, I am only denoising at 40%. Again, you can play with this depending on your need. And everything else I kept as default. I didn't change any of these other elements around seam fixing. Additionally, I'm using a new node called Tiled Diffusion. This really seems to help a lot pretty well. You can see it's a model, right? So it's similar to kind of almost like a LoRa. So in any case, I am then beaming uh, the end model into the sampler, and that's how it's going to go from there. Now you can see from the SD upscale. Um, uh, and by the way, these two are, are kind of optional. Um, they will, you'll see the result is much, much better. Um, it does add a little bit of extra time though. We can talk a little bit about the timing factor. Um, but the ultimate SD upscale does go into a face detailer. Um, not to say this face is bad. I've seen a few that were eh, pretty good, but I wanted to kind of increase the resolution a little bit um, or change the expression, which in this case I did. Um, you'll see in terms of the inputs, it's pretty much the same stuff. Um, one thing you will notice is you can see the VAE here. Um, I am using the 
standard SDXL VA here. Um, the reason, by the way, I didn't beam it in is sometimes you may want to play around. Sometimes you may want to have the baked VAE sometimes for uh, the initial render and then the SDXL standard VAE after that. Um, what I did notice, however, generally speaking, is if I start to use the baked VAE into multiple renders over and over again, it starts to fade out the image. It starts to kind of make it into like a washed sort of look. So just something to keep in mind, um, you know, I've been totally fine having the SDXL standard VAE all the way through, um, but you could play with it and see. Now, a couple of key items that you'll want to take into consideration. First of all, since I am using the face detailer in my loader here, uh, I am enabling that option, which just loads the model, uh, which is good. Um, additionally, the um, a couple of things. Now, this may depend a little bit on your video card memory. So just to keep that in mind, the typical max size is around 512. Um, but if you have the ability to boost it up a little bit to 1024, I found that it does have a little bit better of, um, uh, of an effect on the ending face. Um, and also I increased the guide size a little bit as well. The steps, um, I kept a 20. I've been playing around with this. Um, I think you can vary it a little bit based on your needs. Um, I found if you, if you decrease the number of steps too much, you'll get a weird pixely sort of view. And if you do too much, uh, too many steps, uh, it, it gives too much detail. It over, looks almost a little overbaked. So um, 20 is pretty good. I think that's the standard as well. Uh, you can play with it though. Now let's kind of pause for a second and talk about render speed, right? Because obviously the whole point of lightning is that you're doing the least number of steps to get out the renders as quickly as possible. So let's just quickly count it up here. You have four here in terms of your initial render. You have four here in terms of your high res fix, right? So we're at eight. We have the ultimate uh, SDF scale, so that's 10, so that's going against the entire image. You have 18 total. Uh, not too bad, right? Um, when you get to the face detailer, 20 may seem like a lot, but you're not actually doing it against the entire render. You're actually only doing it against the face itself. So depending on the face size, how many faces you have, this may vary a little bit, but it's really not a lot of time in the whole scheme of things. So don't feel bad if you do have that number slightly higher for detailing out the face, because that's obviously typically your main subject and you want it to really kind of pop and, and to stick out, you know, to in, in a good way, of course. Um, so other than that, you know, you may notice I'm using Karas, you know, the 2M um, I was playing around. I found that was a really good result compared to the normal 3M and compared to some of the other combinations. Kept the denoise at 45%. Uh, percent. Um, again, something you can play with to see how much effect you want on the face. If you really don't care about this initial render face, you can bump this all the way up to 0.8. It'll be a very different face, but maybe that's okay, right? Um, if you want it to be very similar to the original render face, then you'll want to keep this pretty low. You know, 0.3, even you can see 0.45 is pretty good here. And one really cool thing that I learned recently, especially if you have a lot of faces, faces in the background, small faces, things that you don't want to the face detailer to detail and therefore you give you a weird uncanny valley sort of place where the background's you know blurred out except for the face is weird and sharp um, is this drop size so this drop size is the number of I, I think it's the number of pixels or it's the, it just let's just call it the size for now uh relative size of uh where you want the face detailer to actually do its work so in this case there's no real um uh, faces that can be seen in the background that may also be picked up for the face detailing so keeping it at 10 is fine However, if you start to see there's like small children or even small adults, teens, whatever, that are kind of close in the background that you don't want to detail, but you have a really big face here, increase this drop size to maybe like 80, you know, play with it. So start maybe with 40 and then maybe make your way to 80. If you see it cycling, if you see this face detailer cycling many, many times, it's obviously hitting multiple faces. So, you know, you can obviously increase it so it only, you know, cycles through once, which means it's only hitting your main face. Um, I found that to be very helpful. Also, one other final detail point. Most people will ignore this, but this little text box at the bottom is almost like a, a positive prompt that you can help adjust your uh, your face, right? So in this case, you know, if I wanted to keep it more dramatic, you could keep the face default and keep this blank. However, I wanted my cowboy to smiling, but I didn't want to go back and, you know, rework all the original prompts and also that original prompt level of detail maybe pretty, you know, bumped up in terms of all the things you're asking for. So this is a really easy, great way to, you know, 
pop in some final details, skin details, you know, uh, making sure that it's uh, any expressions you want, any sort of like final hairline sort of color, etc. cetera. Um, additionally, you'll want to probably include the gender if it uh, doesn't do the gender correctly, which has happened a couple of times for me, but very, very minor stuff, right? Um, but the result is fantastic. You know, I'm really, really happy with this. It has a nice sort of look and feel. Um, this is a really great model. I definitely recommend it. So let's get into our second item. So this is now our optimized uh, update to our lightning uh, workflow. Um, I did the cowboy shot as well, just to have a sense of comparison. But just so you know, the final result of this flow is going to be very different than the other because A, you're using different models, you're using a different method. So just as an FYI, why the end output may be a little bit different, that's totally fine. Now, one thing to note, um, uh, and I really appreciate, by the way, thank you, thank you, thank you. Always please teach me. Uh, anytime that you find a new technique or if I'm not using something correctly or in the right way, let me know because I love the comments that are coming in on the YouTube by the way, side note, please feel free to subscribe and share with your friends, etc. Um, but a really good note from someone who I was learning from um, had said, hey, you have the load LoRa with the Lightning, but you also have the load LoRa model only. Well, it's pretty much the same thing. So you're just adding 50% and 50%, which is one. So a couple of things I've done to my uh, Lightning flow here to make it a little more optimized. First of all, I got rid of the load LoRa by model only. And I'm only loading the LoRa by itself. I'm using the four step in this case. I know I've used the eight step before. You can actually, I found to be successful, use the two step, which obviously looks gross, just gives you a very general outline, but it kind of leads into then a refining sort of a secondary sampler, which is great. This flow, this optimized flows really works well. So I have the four step here. I also have the high res uh, deep shrink, right? So I have that basically lining up here now. Uh, I also have had comments around using a different deep shrink. That's fine. I actually tested both of them. They do practically the same thing. They have a slight difference in terms of the variation of the image, but really it's practically the same thing. So if you use the other deep shrink by Koya, that's totally, totally fine as well. Um, okay. So we, other than that, um, you'll see that I have the high res fix here as well. Uh, and so in terms of the, uh, model itself, I have, I'm using Fenris here, Fenris Lightning, very, very strong model. Definitely recommend it. Freak did an amazing job uh, on this model. And um, same sort of prompting, right? I use pretty much the same thing. Um, this model rendered a little bit of too much water splash on the hat, so I removed a little bit of that in the prompting. Um, but generally speaking, really, really strong. Same sort of, uh, you could see same parameters around the high res fix uh, as well. Um, I do have this, which um, I did have in the other Lightning model as well, um, kind of an additional positive and negative. I'm concatenating um, the original prompt with any additional details that I want in that secondary render. It's kind of cool. It lets you kind of pop in some additional expression, some, again, skin detail or other little things uh, that you want or not want into your kind of secondary refinement step. Uh, one thing to note, though, of course, right? So if we're talking about, well, what's the overall impact? Uh, it's going to be very little. So don't expect, you know, if you want like a clown in the background or something and there's no clowns at all, don't expect it to, to happen because, again, you're only going four steps. Very, very you know, little in terms of the number of steps. Um, I do have the CFG a slightly higher. In this case, again, you can play with it to get the level of, of effect. Um, again, the cross 50% as normal. Now, that's going to be very cool. Um, I also, by the way, from the other flow, I removed all this extra uh, LoRa's that I had for photography, et cetera, et cetera, um, because you'll see I used um, the ultimate upscale to help. I do have one uh, epic photo and photo realistic in here. I'm only using it at 20% a piece. Uh, is it critical? No. Um, it does help a little bit in terms of the realism, right? If you can see, this is a little more illustrative. Going into the secondary render, it's a little more photorealistic, but again, not perfect yet. Um, that's going to lead us into, right, image is going to pop over here to a uh, final sort of view here. So we're doing that, again, the SD upscale. Um, all the same sort of parameters. The tile width, uh, again, if you can with your video card, uh, definitely recommend bumping it up to 1024 by 1024. And um, otherwise, it's pretty much the same. But you can see it's a really, really nice, strong sort of view, lots of detail in the clothes, the skin, the background as well. There's no sort of like weird banding going on with the background as well. So very, very strong result. Definitely recommend it.
All right, so now onto the big question. So is Photoshop dead or dying? Um, the quick answer is no. Um, I think it's getting there, though. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of new AI functionalities coming out with Photoshop. Now, I have to tell you, you know, there's a lot of new techniques coming into play with uh, Comfy that help kind of push it to the next level uh, and maybe uh, maybe push the need for you to not even use uh, uh, Photoshop in the future. In fact, I used to be a Photoshop kind of guru. I used it all the time, and I barely use it now um, because I, I really use Comfy pretty much fully uh, to meet all of my content generation needs. Um, but you can see here a um, couple of things. So this is called layered diffusion. Um, think of it as layers in Photoshop. And the you know I have, a, again, a strong kind of prompt here. Um, you know, normal uh, sort of checkpoint, right? Nothing special there. However, there is something new to notice. Um, this is called the, it's in the layered diffusion custom node. It's called layer diffuse apply. A um, couple of different options. You can play with it. It does give you uh, different results in terms of kind of like the positioning of the characters. But generally speaking, um, I used attention injection and it was fine. Uh, what you can see I'm kind of doing here if I zoom out, is I am bringing in my model, and then I'm using that in my beamed version uh, after that point. So let's find where our model is. Here it is, right? You can see I'm beaming it and using that in my, my Use Everywhere node. And by doing so, now I have a beamed version that I can use everywhere around my uh, layered diffusion. Now, so what does this do? Layered diffusion sounds cool. All it does is basically pulls out any of the you know, details around background or side objects or whatever, and throws it against a very gray screen, and it automatically kind of masks it for you. So if in terms of just general quick kind of object layout and bashing, photo bashing, etc., this is awesome, right? You'll see here I have my, again, my kind of lightning sort of uh, flow. It's actually not even lightning. It's more of like just a general image to image, but in very small uh, steps here, you know, that's going to bring us here to this stage. Now to pull out the information automatically, there's another node in that custom node set called layer diffuse decode. So the samples coming that is coming from your final sampler, and the images is coming from the image, right? Um, by doing so, it then automatically will pull out the image and the mask. And then you'll also just use this apply a mask to the image, right? So you're taking the image, you're taking the mask, and you can see the result is a perfect, 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 perfect uh, cutout of your subject. So I did that a couple of times. Uh, Spanish dancer with a maraca. I also did it with a guy on a drum set, right? Same sort of thing. And then I uh, needed to create a background. So in this background, I wanted to create like almost like a staged arena for them to play at. And as we've done before with cutting and pasting and overlaying and all that stuff, I have two overlays. So first, I'm overlaying the woman. Um, base image is, of course, the background. The overlay image is, of course, the woman uh, picture. And the mask is coming from the, the cutout woman as well. I'm inverting it, obviously, so it does the background, as we've seen before with this node. And that's it, right? So we did that. We positioned it. We did it again with the drums, right? So we're taking now that's becoming the new base. Right, so the woman and the scenery is the new base. Drums come in, position, all right, and you can see uh, we have now kind of a nice composited layout, very clean, but again, kind of layery, not really blended in as we've done before. We're gonna bring that now finally into our uh, final kind of rendering composition sort of mode where bringing in the singer, I increased the denoise quite a bit. Don't have to, um, but I wanted to get a really kind of dynamic scene out of it where you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of synergy with all of your elements. And you can see it's starting to really get there. People are cheering, lots of excitement, all that good stuff, uh, but only 10 steps. So we're doing a lot of denoise uh, only for 10 steps. And that's going to then uh, lead to the face detailer. Uh, sometimes the faces are a little wonky. This guy's actually not so bad, but now I have that. And I'm using, as we said before, I'm using that text area at the bottom to really highlight you know the, the details of the singer's face uh, and you can see really dynamic sort of scene with just a very simple layer effect with this new layer diffusion uh, option so layering is one piece of it the other piece is effects so obviously in photoshop another key piece is well i could take my layers and i can add 
a drop shadow and color them special and glow and all those other sort of things. And I created a separate example, uh, but basically it's the same sort of deal where I have uh, my, uh, I have a person with balloons. I created kind of like a scenery of a carnival and I'm going to kind of cut and paste them into layers. And there is a node, a node set called layer style. And layer style, all it does is basically you pop in the layer, which is in this case, a composite of the two, right? The person with the balloons and the uh, Ferris wheel. And the person with the balloons is the layer we're playing with. So here in this case, I have a kind of a colorization, uh, kind of almost like a tinting of that layer. I have a drop shadow. And all it is is, right, just taking that individual image with the person and as a layer into the background. And I'm in, applying the color and changing the attributes. And I'm playing the drop shadow and I'm playing with the attributes or glow, playing with the attributes. Uh, also, actually, within this uh, custom note set is a set of uh, color pickers, which is really strong. And I can just pipe that into the inputs, right? As we said before, you can right click any node and change it into an input. So I changed the light and the glow color as an input and basically inputting those uh, hex values. So I don't have to go to a hex site or go into Photoshop to find out the hex value. It does that automatically, right? So that's really great. And, but you can see, so again, all these are typical Photoshop layer type of things that I'm doing in seconds. Uh, so it's really not a lot of effort at all. And you can see in this case, I'm using the comfy roll uh, sort of text node. I'm doing the, the uh, uh, sort of overlay. I wanna do text stroke with different colors. And so I can, you know, do again, an image overlay here. And, um, and this node, right, the kind of layer style node, they have actually their own text uh, as well to, to be able to do. And uh, for fonts, right, if I click here, there's not that many fonts here, similar to Comfy Roll, where you have the font folder under the custom nodes of the Comfy Roll Studio uh, folder, right? It's a subfolder called Fonts. Same thing here, right? So they have a, a subfolder called Fonts under the layer style node. So obviously you don't wanna have like multiple copies of the same fonts all over the place. And so you can use a reference link, or you can use other ways so that you have a single font directory that you're just pointing to, uh, that you're pointing to with everything. A text image here. And then finally, I have one where I want to just tint the whole image, the whole resulting image. And so I did, again, an overlay of the person and the uh, carnival, added the mask as well. And then I um, uh, applied another set of layer styles in here to change the, I added like a green tint. So I changed the green level and I changed a little bit of the contrast and the brightness and then popped it into the preview. So you can see lots of power here to be able to apply all the normal Photoshop standard uh, effects, uh, layer effects and, and stylings. And this library has a ton of, I, I'm only scratching the surface, but there's a ton of different transformation options here as well. Um, okay, so you have that, but you're like, well, I, I wanna be able to do my Photoshop layers that I would do in Photoshop where I can drag and drop my layers and I can change the order and I can draw on top of them, et cetera. Well, that, in that case, I'm gonna just refer right back to our normal uh, canvas, right? So in canvas, we can uh, do all those normal things. Uh, we can obviously go into our canvas here and you know create a, uh, a new layer here to bring our initial image in. If I pop in my my first layer here, obviously you can go in here as we've done in many of the other videos. And I can just then from that point, you know, pop in all the other layers. So if I pop in my, you know, guy here as a layer, and I then pop in my uh, text layer here as a layer, right? It's, it's pretty much, again, something that you can do just like you can do in Photoshop and you can like, you know, drag and drop the different layers to as you would normally do it. And you can move the layers around as we've seen, right? So there's there's lots of different options to play with, um, which is just like Photoshop. So hope this was helpful. I know we went through a lot of content, but as always, really appreciate all of your feedback. Please have it coming. Please share and subscribe, and we will talk to you soon.